Sunday, we are going to continue in our study in the book of Colossians. Uh, so if you'll turn there in the New Testament, the book of Colossians, chapter 1, we've gone as far as verse 15. That's where we'll pick up our reading. We're actually going to only cover three verses this morning, but I believe uh, that you're going to be tremendously blessed um, as we're established in truth. And as Paul is writing to this uh, church here, as he's chained to a Roman guard, this church, you remember in the opening uh, statement that Paul makes to them, if you've been with us, is that uh, he would uh, commend them, saying that you're known for your faith in Jesus Christ. Paul had never visited this church. You're known for your love for all the saints. And they were referred to this church as faithful brethren. And it would cause Paul to pray for them, and he was thankful for them. And last week in verses 9 through 11, we saw what it was specifically that Paul prayed for them. And before we continue on, let's pray. Father, as we come on this Father's Day, I thank you for the fathers that are here, for all of us that are here, our children. And we are very grateful that we have a good, good Father, a Heavenly Father that loves us and cares for us. And Lord, I pray that this morning as we open up your word, that not only are we established in truth of the preeminence of Christ and the divinity of Christ, that what does it mean for us? Not just looking at this doctrinally, that's very important. But Lord, what does it mean for us personally? And I pray that our hearts would be just teachable right now and our ears open to hear from you and we would all leave here just blessed and encouraged because we took the time to be in this place to hear your word, to, to hear your voice. And I pray that um, every single one of us would be touched deeply by your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul prayed that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will, that you would walk worthy of the Lord, and that you would continue to produce fruit for the Lord, and that you would grow in the knowledge of the Lord, and may the Lord strengthen you in patience and long suffering. And in our lives, in the seasons that we go through, we need patience. We, the long suffering that is difficult, we need the Lord working in our lives. And it's interesting that Paul, he puts the spiritual priorities uh, in his prayers for us. And, and I learn how I am to pray, how to pray for myself and to pray for others. And Paul, he mentioned what it was that he was praying for them. And then he expressed his thankfulness to the Lord, as we saw last week in verses 12 through 14. That he has qualified us to be partakers of his inheritance. He has delivered us from the power of darkness. Peter writes in his epistle, he's brought us out of the darkness into his marvelous light. He's forgiven us. He's redeemed us. And that should cause us always to be thankful, even as we discuss in our Philippians study recently, that there's a theme there that Paul, another one of these prison epistles, he says that we're to rejoice always. Again, I say rejoice, to be thankful. And we have reason to be thankful as Christians, even in the difficulties and the hardships that we go through, because he has given us so much, eternal life. We have relationship with the Father that we have his word given to us, his promises are for us. And these things that Paul spells out to the church of Colossae causes us to be thankful. And as I mentioned over the last couple of weeks, as we looked at in the first 14 verses of Colossians, that they were doing well as he commends them. You're known for your faith and for your love. And fruit is being produced in, in the church and in the lives of the believers. But there was some concerns. There was problems that were brought to Paul by Epaphras, who was the pastor of the church. And it was false doctrine that had crept into the church. It was, would develop into what was known as Gnosticism. And that teaching that was being brought to the Christians, not just of Colossae, but I'm sure to the churches of Asia Minor and, and to the Gentile churches elsewhere, and perhaps even into, uh, in Jerusalem, wherever the churches were, that it was gaining popularity, this doctrine. And it would deny the preeminence of Christ. It would deny the sufficiency of Christ and the deity of Christ. And those things were false that the Gnostics were teaching the Christians to believe in. And the apostle, the great apostle here, remember he's inspired by the Spirit of God, is going to address that. And we're going to see that very specifically 
as we journey through this chapter and in the next chapter. So as we pick up our text here, Paul will establish truth to them once again, and for us, truth concerning the preeminence of Christ. First in creation, verses 15 through 18. Then Paul will move to the preeminence of Christ in redemption, verses 19 through 23. And then the preeminence of Christ in the church as he is the head in verses 24 through 29. And so Paul, he gives thanks to God for the wonderful work of God. And now he's going to talk about the work and person of Jesus Christ, showing us, listen, that Jesus is God. Verse 15, we read of chapter 1 of Colossians that Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. Uh, don't believe what these Gnostics are telling you, what they're bringing into the church, the confusion, their, their doctrine, their teaching. They would come in the Gnostics. The Gnostics, it, it means to know. They, they, they claim to have special knowledge and uh, revelation that no one else had. Don't believe what they are saying. Don't believe what they are teaching that diminishes the one, our Lord Jesus, who has redeemed us, forgiven us, that has brought you out of the darkness of the world into his marvelous light, the one who has qualified you to be a partaker of the inheritance of the saints. For this one, Jesus, what he has done, but also who he is. The redemptive work for you? Know that he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And what Paul is stating very clearly, listen, is that Jesus is God. God is fully and completely in every way revealed in Jesus Christ. Not that Jesus is similar to the Father, but Jesus is the image, the likeness, the manifestation, the reflection of God. Jesus is God manifested in the flesh. He reflects God perfectly. Now, as we read this, it does remind us of John chapter 14 in that upper room. It was Jesus that would say that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Not a way or a truth. I am the way, the truth, the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And Philip, he pipes up and says, well, show us the Father that it may suffice us. And it was Jesus, I think, in a voice of disappointment that he would say, oh, Philip, You've been with me all this time, three years, and you say, show us the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And what Jesus was saying in that is that if you want to know what the Father is like, if you want to know the character and the nature and the essence of the Father, look to me if you want to know the heart of the Father. Because the Father and I are one. And Jesus would say very plainly and clearly in his earthly ministry that to know God is to know him. No one can know God or come to God apart from Jesus Christ. In John chapter 1 and verse 18, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So this truth that Jesus is God, the deity of Jesus, we know that today that it is dismissed by many. There are those who will come along and say, well, Jesus was just a great religious man. There are those who will come along and tell you and me that he was just a, a famous historical figure or a religious teacher or some special guru or they put him on the same level as other religious leaders and listen, Jesus, his name is above as Philippians 2 declares all other names that he is the one that is highly exalted and every knee shall bow down to the glory of Jesus and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father, as Paul would write in that other prison epistle. Don't put them on the same level as other religious leaders. There are those who will come along, and I pray that we never fall into this. Oh, you know, it doesn't matter. Confucius, Muhammad, Buddha, Jesus, it's all the same. God expressed in different ways. No, it's not. Jesus alone went to the cross and died for you. He alone rose from the grave, and he conquered sin and death, proving that he is the Son of God. And all those other religious leaders are still in their tomb. Jesus is the one that he is the express image of God. And we see that, that Paul says, I want you to understand this. I want you to be established in this. But what is unfortunate, that there are those who call themselves Christians and even, uh, you know, pastors behind the pulpit, that they will begin to diminish the deity of Jesus Christ or 
salvation comes through Christ alone. There's many ways to God. All these different things, progressive theology, denying his deity, questioning that Jesus is the express image of God, and it is very sad. So I pray that we are established in truth. And whenever you hear something, even as John would say, that you test what is being said through the scriptures, test the spirits to see if they are true. Because there's a lot of voices out there that will confuse you. And we also know that one of the characteristics of the cults, such as Mormonism and Jehovah Witness, and others, they will deny that Jesus is God. Now, they'll say that, oh, he's the son of God, but he's not equal with God, the second person of the Godhead Trinity, that in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh, as John writes, and dwelt among us. And now Paul is going to build on this truth, that Jesus is the express image of God, so Christ's supremacy is first shown in his relationship with God the Father. And then you can write down Christ's perfect resemblance and representation of God. Secondly, Christ's supremacy in his relationship to now creation. He is the firstborn over all creation. Now it's the Mormons that will come along in, in their doctrine. And they will take this verse that we just read and they will tell you, See, Jesus was created. He's the first, you know, born of creation. And what they believe is that God the Father, who is married to God the Mother, that they had billions of spirit children, and those spirit children become human beings. And if they progress in Mormonism and adopting the Mormon doctrine and get sealed with somebody in the temple, in their Mormon temple, that they can progress when they go to heaven. They believe that there's three different heavens. And the third and highest heaven, there's seven levels. And if you progress enough, that you can become a god, you and your wife, and you can populate a planet. You can create that. That's the official doctrine of Mormonism. And they believed that. They believed Jesus was the firstborn of the spirit children, and Lucifer was the second. So Lucifer is the brother of Jesus. So all this that they, they tried to, to back up with this verse, that see, Jesus was created. Our doctrine is true. The Jehovah Witnesses tell you that Jesus was Michael the Archangel. So as we look at this carefully, we need to know what is being told to us. He is the firstborn over all creation. What does that mean? Well, verses 16 and 17, let's read it. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. So he is the creator of all things. I don't know if you realize this, but... In the Greek, all, you know what it means? It means all. It means all. He's the creator of all things. The Bible never teaches that Jesus was created and then he created all other things. Again, that's what the Mormons teach. That's what others that deny the deity of Jesus Christ will hold on to, that Jesus is a created being. In verse 15, when Paul uses the word firstborn, it means before, foremost. He was before creation. Verse 17, he is before all things. So how can you be a created being and then create everything that was created? You can't. doesn't make sense. You are either created or you're the creator. And so Paul here makes sure that we understand that he's the creator of all things and he writes in verse 16, all things were created by him, let's read it again, that are in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, all things were created through him and for him. In verse 17, he is before all things. He cannot be created if he's before all of creation. Paul, inspired by the Spirit of God, telling us very clearly that he was before all creation. He created all things. And Paul will say when we get to verse 18 that he has preeminence to all things. Just as there are those today as there was 2,000 years ago, those who deny that Jesus is the creator and he's created or was just merely a man, whatever it might be, they deny that he is God come in human flesh Paul was dealing with the false teachers of his day. 
that are out there today. But the Gnostics, and there are those, remember, there are those who bring false doctrine to you. A lot of times they will do what the Gnostics said. We have special knowledge. We have a, another gospel. We have special revelation. We have knowledge that nobody else has. So the Gnostics here doing that, they denied his supremacy, his deity. They said that all physical matter, material was evil. And Jesus, he couldn't have created that. And Jesus, he didn't have a body because that's evil. It just looked like he had a body. So it would come to the conclusion that Jesus didn't bodily resurrect from the grave. You remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Paul makes the case that the very foundation of our faith is Jesus bodily rose from the grave. He bodily suffered. He was beaten. They beat him. They pulled out his beard. They took that crown of thorns and they pounded it on his head and lacerated his scalp. That cat of nine tails that was put on his back that they scourged him, the Roman uh, soldiers there. It, it would just tear his back, the skin off his back. He was beaten beyond recognition. To where Pilate said, look at him. Look at the man. Look what they've done to him. He suffered in ways that we cannot fully understand, like a, a, a lamb that was led to the slaughter. Marred more than any other man, Isaiah says. He bled into the ground when he hung on that cross for you. And then his body was prepared by Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, put into the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea, he was buried, and then he rose again bodily from the grave. And because we believe in the gospel that Jesus Christ died for our sins and rose again, we have the promise that we will be resurrected. So as we look at that, here what was happening is there was some Greek mysticism. I think it, it was uh, what was called Demiurge, something like that, where God created a creature just beneath him is what they were saying 2,000 years ago. And that creature created a being just beneath him, and uh, that created a being that created other beings, and down the line to one of those beings created the universe, the world. And Jesus was somewhere in that line. Very confusing. So when we read here that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation, it denotes two things. Remember this. He preceded the whole of creation, and he is sovereign over all creation. That's why Jesus has preeminence, the place of priority over all creation. Now, the Old Testament in the book of Jeremiah, verse 9 of chapter 31, Ephraim is called and referred to as the firstborn. But he wasn't the firstborn of, of the, the patriarchs of the 12 tribes of Israel. It's speaking of a place of priority. Jacob is called the firstborn of Isaac, and we know that Esau was actually born first. So again, it's speaking of priority. So Jesus is the firstborn over all creation, has priority, preeminence over all creation. He is the creator, just as told that God is the creator in Genesis chapter 1. And as you look at his creation, it tells us something of the power and the wisdom of our creator, how wonderful he is, doesn't it? Some of you have already done this, but now that the weather is warming up and it's drying up, many of you will go camping and enjoy the beautiful Colorado mountains. And isn't it wonderful when we get out in the rural areas, or maybe you live out there and you can see the Milky Way galaxy and the stars. And David, 3,000 years ago, is out there in the wilderness. And he's looking up and he says, The heavens declare your glory, O Lord. To look up there in all those stars that he spoke and it came into existence. What is interesting in the Genesis account of creation, it just says, and he made the stars. That's it. It's incredible to look at it, how it declares his glory. And then the, all of Bible is speaking about the crowning jewel of his creation. And that is you. But he created all of that. Did you know that the sun has a diameter of 864,000 miles? That is 100 times that of the earth and can hold 1.3 million earths inside the sun. The star Betelgeuse has a diameter of 100 million miles, which is larger than the earth's 
orbit around the sun. We know that when the sun gives its light, speed of what, 186,000 miles per second, it takes about eight and a half seconds for it to reach the earth. That same light takes about four years to reach the earth from Alpha Centauri, which is 24 trillion miles from the earth, the closest star, the closest solar system that is to our solar system, the Milky Way galaxy, and, 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 um, or in the Milky Way galaxy. But our Milky Way galaxy is so huge, and yet it is told to us that the Milky Way galaxy is an average side galaxy. So here, 24 trillion miles away, the closest solar system to our solar system, Milky Way galaxy that has billions of stars, you look up and, and there's galaxies by the billions. They don't know how many there are out there in the visible universe. When I was in school a long, long time ago, I remember they said that they believed that the visible universe is about 4 billion light years. Now it's more like 20 because of the powerful telescopes. They don't know how big the universe is. And the Lord spoke, and it all came into existence. When you look at the Saturn's beautiful rings, they're some 500,000 miles in circumference, but only about one foot thick. The sun and Taurus, 60,000 times larger than our sun. So to give you a perspective of that, if our sun was the size of a softball, Antares would be the size of the church. There's a dwarf star, just a little bedtime reading I was doing, it called LP327-186. This star is smaller than the state of Texas, yet they believe it is so dense that if a cubic inch of it were brought to the earth, it would weigh more than 1.5 million tons. How they know all this, I don't know. But that's what they say. Did you know that the Earth, when it comes to the Earth, travels around the sun about eight times the speed of a bullet fired from a gun and we don't fall off? And by the way, just so you know, the Earth is round. It is not flat, okay? <laughs> that if you change the distance of the Earth from the sun, the nitrogen-oxygen ratio, the land mass to water mass, slightly, even as much as 1%, life would change drastically or be eliminated as we know it. When you look at the single human chromosome, it contains 70 billion bits of information. In our brains, about three pounds, for most of us, <laughs> contains 12 billion you know, neurons in the most complicated arrangement of matter known to man. Some 120 trillion connections in the human brain. So when you look at the complexity, the diversity of life, the order of life, and we have the audacity to say it happened by evolution, by Big Bang, by random chance, and I remember struggling with this when I was a student at CSU, young, and in a science field, and, and being taught that all these things happen, looking at the different ecology and the diversity and different ecosystems and, and the diversity of it. And it was amazing when you looked at it. It was quite fascinating, like the lodgepole pine up that we have, that God made it to where that when the lodgepole produces a pine cone that is serotonous. What does it mean? It means it's solid. And the only way to open up that pine cone for it to drop its, its um, um, you know, seeds to reforest is heat, is a fire. God made it that way so when a fire goes through, that all of a sudden there's a new forest that's going to begin to, to come forth. And we, we saw it in Yellowstone. I was in Yellowstone when it burned a million acres. The politicians were all there, this is it, it's all over, no. It was pine beetles went through, fire followed, that's natural part of ecology, the brand new forest there. Incredible. And I remember looking at that thinking, you're telling me this all happened by chance? By evolutionary processes? I don't think so. There is a creator 
Paul would write in Romans chapter 1, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power in Godhead, so that none are without excuse. You're going to tell me this happened by chance? No, it didn't. Because there's a wonderful creator who created all things, and what does it mean for you and for me? I want to draw attention before we close to the last sentence of verse 16. All things were created through him and for him. You were created for him. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, in that heavenly scene, there's the 24 elders around the throne of God worshiping. And the one who sat on the throne, and they're casting their crowns before the throne, saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and for thy pleasure, the King James reads, they are and were created. You are created to give glory and honor and pleasure to the Creator, Jesus Christ. And when any of us say, Lord, I am going to live this day and every day for you, for your good pleasures. That's when you're going to have true purpose and joy and peace and fulfillment and happiness. But if any of us say, I will live for myself, you won't find it. And there's a lot of people looking for it in the world. And they're living all kinds of bizarre lifestyles because they're not finding it and they're not living the purpose that they were, are supposed to and that is to have fellowship with a wonderful creator that loves them and has provided salvation through his son. And they don't have real true purpose and fulfillment and peace and joy. And perhaps there may be somebody here today and certainly all of us know people in our lives that say, I'm going to live for myself. I'm going to do what I please. And you will go to bed and they go to bed. Depressed and blue and wonder, is this what life is all about? Is there more to life? Why do I feel so empty? Because you don't realize, or they don't realize, you were made for his good pleasure to glorify Jesus Christ. And the person who says, I don't want to live for the Lord, I don't like that, that I was created for his good pleasure, for his will, that is a choice that you make. But you will not be truly satisfied and fulfilled in life because you are rebelling against what you were created for, to love God and to live for God and to have fellowship with him. You were created by him and for him. And how sad and tragic it is today that our world is telling us and our kids that you weren't made in the image of God, that you're a product of a monkey, of evolutionary processes, rather than a loving God who wonderfully made this universe, this world, and made you. That you might live for him and for him. That he loved you so much that he sent his son to this world to die for you individually, specifically, that one day that you and I might be around that throne of God worshiping him. That we are created by him. And we are created today, this morning, to worship him and to learn of him and to know him and to walk with him. And many people don't know that truth. And there is a void in their heart. And there's an emptiness in their lives. Because they were made for him and by him. So he created all things. Created for his good pleasure, you and I. Secondly, as we close, verse 17, he's before all things, and in him all things consist. All things consist, secondly, or it might be translated maybe in your Bible, held together. That's what it means. He holds all things together. Interesting when you think about it, magnets. You know, we've all, maybe when we were kids or your kids play with magnets and 
you know, I have these, these magnets that hold my net, you know, when I fly fish, and it always seems I get the positive charges, and I, they don't connect, they push, and it frustrates me, and what did I do to the other piece? Because we know positive charges on magnets, they, you push them together, they repel, like charges repel, opposite charges attract, right? That's a law of physics. Now, when it comes to the atom, and I'm not a physicist, but you have the protons, which are positive charged particles. You have the neutrons, and you have electrons that are spinning around, negative charges. And maybe you recall in those little models of the atom in your science class at school. And, and it's a mystery to scientists, even to this day, even though there's a lot of complicated uh, physics and, and um, all that uh, that goes into it. Uh, you look at it, and, and what keeps those little protons from repelling like charges and atoms that are, make up all things? Scientists really don't know exactly how the atom is held together, and there's all kinds of theories, and you get into quantum physics and subatomic particles and gluons and quarks and quantums and chromodynamics uh, holds it all together. When I was in school 100 years ago in middle school, I remember there was a science teacher, he said, oh, it's just atomic glue. That's what we call it. They didn't know what else to call it. Keep the like charges from repelling and, and the atom exploding and thus the world coming to an end, just exploding. And that's why when they split the atom in developing nuclear weapons or in that technology, they were afraid is this going to cause a change reaction and we're going to blow up the whole world. It's atomic glue. It holds it all together. Well, you and me this morning, we know the answer. It's Jesus. He holds all of creation together. The atom, he keeps the earth in its orbit, the moon in its orbit, the universe in its order. He holds it all together. And one day, the Bible tells us, he's going to let it go. And Peter says in his epistle on that day, the heavens will dissolve being on fire and the elements will melt with fervent heat. There'll be a great noise and the earth and its work will be burnt up. Revelation chapter 20, that the earth and the, and the heavens, as we know it, will be no more. It'll be gone. The universe is going to go up in a huge nuclear explosion when Jesus lets go. And then we get to watch him create a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem, and it will be so glorious and awesome. And so Peter says, therefore, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness? So Jesus holds all the universe together. He holds the world together. In him all things consist. He holds it together. That includes you. That includes you in your life. And as we go through this, we need to be reminded. And I need to be reminded it in my life, when it comes to my family, even in the difficulties, and we go through sorrow, and we go through difficulties of life, and the challenges of life, and the loss. As I watch my mom's body decay, I know that she's still in his hands. And when it comes to my life, my family, my decisions, my emotion, my joy, my happiness, he's the one that holds it together. And you see, when we forget that, that all things are made by him and for him, and all things are held together by him, when I forget that, and I start to do my own thing and go my own way and figure things out in my own thoughts, or I'm tough and I'm together in reality, it begins to fall apart. And I need to remember all of us this, that the Lord wants the very best for us, doesn't he? And he's given us the very best. And he wants to hold your marriage and your family, your job, your business, your ministry, your life together. Because Jesus said, you're in the Father's hand, and no one's going to pluck you out. So my prayer is as we leave this place, 
Do we know we have a wonderful creator that holds our life together every day, every minute? In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much for this incredible three verses that it's more than just a theological discussion, but so much personal implication for us. And I know that there are those that are here that have gone through loss or going through difficulties and sometimes can even wonder, Lord, do you see, do you know? You do. And you know. So we thank you for your love and faithfulness to us. And I pray that we would always understand that we were created for your good pleasures. We are your workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I thank you that your son came and died for us. And we were created to have fellowship with you made possible through the atoning work of Jesus and his resurrection. So I want to pray just while we just got a couple minutes left. Maybe you're here and you're thinking, Lord, I've been doing my own thing, living my own way. You're going to get cheated. And you're going to come to that place of just emptiness and wondering. And you see, when we live our own way, when we go and try to figure things out in our own understanding, or we're involved in sin, it just ruins all that, what the Lord has for us. Come to him. He's calling you. Let me hold it together in your life, every area. When it comes to relationships, your family, your job, your health, just trust him and trust his word for you. I say, I would say, who has been his counselor? The problem I know for me, Lord, and I'm so sorry, is I try to be at times. And how foolish it is. So, Lord, I just pray that all of us would right now, today, before we leave here in a few minutes, say, we trust you and we walk with you every day of our lives. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone that's watching that is here, you've never made a commitment to Christ. He is your salvation. He is the way. He's not a way. He is the way. The life. The truth. No one comes to the Father except through him. And after he said that, he took a cross, walked down the Via della Rosa, the way of sorrows to the place of execution with you on his mind and on his heart and died for you, for your sins, and rose again, that we might come into fellowship with the Father, be forgiven, brought out of the darkness into his marvelous light, and come into the kingdom of God as adopted sons and daughters, a kingdom that will last forever. And he invites you to repent. Quit going the direction you're going and turn to Christ and call out to him in the sincerity of your heart. The cry out, Jesus, I come to you and I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I need you. Forgive me. Be my Lord and Savior because I know that you are Lord. You rose from the grave and I want to know you and walk with you and live a life pleasing to you. Help me to keep my eyes on you, to learn of you. And I thank you for this new beginning. And I thank you for bringing us here. I pray you bless all the dads that are here. And I pray that you help us to lead our families, to minister to our children, to minister to our grandchildren to take the calling that you've given to us, to fight the good fight in the spirit, 
and to be strong and courageous. So, Lord, I thank you for today. Bless everyone here as we go our way. In Jesus' name.